Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at ANSYS with Kartek Srinivasan. We're going to talk today about 10 nanometers, 7 nanometers, and the impact of heat on reliability and also the functioning of uh, FinFETs. We've been hearing for a while about the dynamic uh, current density, the leakage. What are some of the problems that you're starting to see at 10 nanometers, 7 nanometers, and are these a continuation of what really began at, at 16, 14? So dynamic current density, one of the biggest advantage of FinFET is the 3D nature of the transistors. So the FinFET basically has a raised diffusion and a gate all around the diffusion that is raised, which gives it a higher drive strength. And by going from 16 nanometer down to 7 nanometer, one of the things that we, uh, you know, foundries have done is basically raising the height of the diffusion in order to achieve better scaling, which gives them better drive strength, better area efficiency, but it also increases the power density or rather the current density on the metal interconnects that are connected to these fin devices. And that essentially means higher current on narrower metals, which actually leads to uh, bigger issues with respect to voltage drop or reliability. Why don't you draw this out for us? Sure. So I'm just going back to the basics of 20 nanometer FET, where you have these planar devices and you have the gate around these planar devices. So this is more like a cross-section view that you can think of, where um, you have the drain, source, and gate, and you have the channel that is formed over here, which actually has the actual current flow, and the heat is actually generated in the channel, which gets dissipated through the substrate. But if you go back to uh, you know 16 nanometer uh, FinFET, or FinFET in general, what is happening is with the same substrate, you have these raised diffusion structures, which are, um, again, pardon my drawing, it's basically just a 3D representation of a raised diffusion, where um, you have your gate sitting on top of the diffusion, and the gate is wrapping up these uh, diffusion structures. So this is, say, fin one, fin two, and typically you can have three fins, four fins, and n number of fins. And this gives a very high amount of control. So your gate voltage that you're applying is going to be all around the channel and it gives a very good control uh, for the device. And that increases the overall drive strength as well. So now going in from 16 to seven, uh, what is actually happening or maybe even down to five, what you can essentially do is to maybe uh, increase the height of the fin. So that's the best one can do in order to uh, of course, on top of other fabrication techniques, uh, the fundamental thing that is being done is to basically increase the height of the fin in order to uh, increase the drive strength and improve the overall area efficiency. So the fin depopulation, instead of having, say, four fins in 16 nanometer, you can have like two fins in seven nanometer with the increased height, and that essentially gives uh, better drive strength. And so what you get out of putting in uh, higher fins and actually more fins is better control of the gate structure, but you don't necessarily reduce the heat in that because of the dynamic current, right? That is correct. So in fact, it is going to make it worse because these raised diffusions are going to be surrounded by dielectrics and dielectrics have very poor uh, thermal conductivity when compared to silicon substrate or when compared to the metal interconnects. So this essentially forms like a heat trap. Whatever current that is flowing through the channel Cannot, uh, the heat cannot be dissipated through the silicon substrate directly, or all of the heat cannot be distributed through the uh, silicon substrate. The only pathway is through the metal interconnects that are connected to, the, to these devices, or the metal interconnects that are right on top of it with the heat flowing through the uh, dielectrics. So previous to 1614, what everybody was worried about was the leakage. Now what you're worried about is the dynamic current. The leakage is starting to build though as well, right? Mm -hmm. And so you've got both of these com compounding. Yes, leakage always has a very high dependency on temperature. So with higher temperature, your leakage is also going to get worse. But now with the higher fins, with the better drive strength, your current density is also becoming a big challenge. And on top of it, you have like a 3x uh, node count increase as well as a resistivity increase from 16 nanometer down to 7 nanometer. And that essentially means you need to have more number of VR connections from on your power grid. You need to have a more uh, efficient PG uh, power planning in order to minimize the overall voltage drop. So what goes wrong as a result of this? 
So the real impact is on your back end of the back end of the line interconnects. Basically, you have thinner interconnects which carries more amount of current. You have 3D devices which cannot dissipate the heat through the substrate. So your heat gets coupled from the device to the interconnect and your thinner device, thinner interconnects basically carrying higher amount of current leads to higher uh, delta T or joule heating on the interconnect. So the, essentially every interconnect will basically have the delta T from the uh, joule heating and also the delta T coupling from the device itself. So this leads to very um, uh, high amount of localized self-heating effects. So in the past, uh, you know, foundries typically recommend a five degree delta T as a ballpark number. The five degree essentially means with just the joule heating on the interconnect, you may end up seeing a five degree increase in temperature, but now the five degree is no longer valid. It may be five degree, it may be 20 degree, depending on how powerful the device is, how much power is actually dissipated from the device below. We've been hearing about self-heating for a while. What is that? So self-heating essentially is the heating on the channel that cannot be uh, dissipated through the substrate. So the heating of these transistors that gets coupled through to the interconnects, that is the effect. And what's the impact of that? Impact is basically lifetime. So as everybody knows, the temperature is uh, having an exponential, inverse exponential dependence on the lifetime. So as your temperature increases, your lifetime goes down. Maybe with every five degree Celsius increase in the temperature, your lifetime decreases by 30%. So what, how does this actually play out? So reliability is a word that we're all used to in electronics when it doesn't work, but this isn't necessarily it doesn't work, it just doesn't work 100%, right? Yes. So reliability inherently is a statistical um, nature. It, the EM limits that you typically get from the foundries are assuming that there is a 0.1% failure rate over the operation time of your SOC, which is say maybe five years rating or 10 years rating, you get a current limit on the interconnects with the assumption that there is a 0.1% failure rate, which is inherently more like a statistical um, number. So taking that uh, statistical impact, so just because you have one interconnect that has a electromigration failure, it does not mean your SOC is gonna be useless. People are looking at more innovative ways of handling reliability. People are looking at statistical AEM budgeting. So uh, historically, all the microprocessor companies have been using this for ages, where they do what they call as a fit rate calculation. Rather than looking at electromigration on the individual interconnects, they typically do a failure in time calculation for the entire chip which looks at the cumulative probability of the failure of several interconnect, several devices in the chip, rather than looking at the individual interconnect. And we are looking at similar approaches being adopted even in traditional SOCs these days, going into 16 and 7 nanometer. So is this getting more severe as we move down node to node? So 10, uh, 7 versus 16, 14? Yes, definitely it is. EM sign off is getting more challenging. Um, because EM is more like a painkiller. So if you want to uh, waive a certain EM violation, you have to go through several levels of hierarchy in order to waive a particular EM violation. But as I said, the inherent nature of EM is statistical. So rather than looking at a EM as a hard-coded limit that you want to sign off against, people are looking at more statistical ways of handling it. And uh, you know that is why uh, the statistical EM budgeting or the fit calculation comes into picture. Rather than looking at EM, they look at how it is actually impacting the failure probability of the entire chip. If the EM impact has a very high failure probability, then they do fix that EM violation. But if the EM impact is not going to impact the overall failure probability of the chip, then they, uh, they don't really care about the EM violation. They waive those EM. So one of the things that we're hearing is that automotive companies are now looking at moving down into uh, 10.7 and maybe even five nanometers mm -hmm. for some of their chips. Is there a way of, of figuring out just how reliable these are going to be over time? Because we're starting to deal with a lot of these effects. Yeah, I think uh, fit rate is not new to automotive. So uh, especially fit at system, uh, even at the anterior automotive itself is, 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 has been there for ages. So the concept of fit is more look new to her for our SOC uh, you know, customers who are actually doing the traditional fabless uh, SOCs and they typically sign off EM 
they want to guarantee that the chip is going to work without any failure. But now with the high, uh, the lifetime getting higher and higher, so you're looking at targeting instead of five year lifetime, you're looking at 10 year, 15 year lifetime. And going into FinFair, trying to target that level of reliability over such a long duration is what becomes a really big challenge. As you want to, uh, as you want to have like a really good lifetime for this, then you need to really over design your chip in order to meet the very stringent EM limits that actually Foundry provides. So instead of going that EM sign off approach, people are looking at more statistical approach to come up with the overall failure rate for maybe the blocks, failure rate for the SOC, and maybe even the failure rate for the entire system. And that essentially gels well with the system vendors as well. They can take the failure probability of different SOCs in the PC board and determine the overall failure probability of the entire part. So rather than guard banding the design, really what you're doing is guard banding the simulation and things like that, right? You're adding that, that extra step of we can make sure that this works and we can do it here as opposed to uh, actually in silicon. Yes, that is true. What happens when we start getting into advanced packaging? Does that alleviate some of these problems? Um, it's still to be seen. A lot of uh, new technologies are evolving, like uh, Info, Integrated Fan Out, Cobos, and several other um, you know, my, uh, packaging techniques are evolving. Um, one of the key challenge is these are not true packaging shapes, but at the same time, these are not, uh, the shapes are not very similar to the die. So you do require a very highly accurate, more like a 3D extraction engine in order to model these packaging interconnects, both for reliability, for signal integrity, and any other effects to be captured for that. So a lot of these are still to be seen, but the short answer is it is going to help out to some extent because you're trying to partition the problem, the power density into different chips lying in the same package or same wafer. Um, uh, so in that case, you're distributing the power density, you have better control on which one to turn on, which one to turn off, um, maybe better mechanisms, placing thermal sensors, placing some thermal diodes in order to dissipate the heat, rather than crunching so much of logic into a single SOC. Cartex Srinivasan, thank you very much for a great explanation. Thank you, you're welcome.